All right, um, thanks. Um, well, first of all, you know, thank you to, to, to all the, uh, the speakers to in, in, you know, intriguing uh, contributions. Um, um, I'd, I'm not quite sure uh, you know, what to do with uh, Mijito's uh, um, sort of non-presence non intervention here. I mean, I, the... She's dead. Yeah, <laughs> I d I d there is, um, I mean, it's a little bit, the, the, the idea of, kill, you know, of suicide is, you know, is um, I think there's a lot of Christianity in that. That is probably not particularly healthy. Um, <laughs> you know, this sort of guilt and... Um, um, uh, okay, I mean, let's, um, I'd, I'd like to sort of um, start by um, really bringing, bringing back the idea of um, sort of struggle being, a, you know, what, what you said this morning, Rene, uh, the, the, the idea of, of struggle being something that is not, you know, um, timely anymore, that is sort of not adequate anymore in terms of, uh, you know, understanding political activism and um, because there's nothing really one struggles again. I mean, I've heard, the, I've, I, you know, I was sensing struggle in, in both Natalie's and, uh, and also uh, Richard's um, 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 presentation. So, I mean, my first question would be to the two of you and, and, you know, also maybe from this sort of crazy design perspective. I mean, if, if can, can, can we still perceive of, of, you know, this sort of activism as struggle? And if yes, you know, what are you struggling against? You know. Well, perhaps I'll start with that because I, I think the stakes have really changed in dealing with biological materials um, because, of course, they've been weaponized. And those of us who deal with microbiological agents, you know, I can't carry them. I, you know, my very close colleague, Steve Kurtz, was under bioterrorism charges for four and a half years. Um, several scientists with <laughs> very credentialed have um, gone through similar trials. And... The stakes for um, a culture of fear to have a kind of um, even innocent or playful or um, it's just no fun, right? It's just, it's not fun to be arrested and incarcerated. I mean, it's just not interesting um, or fun, which is why I think, you know, my own um, conceptual struggle is, you know, what works now? Um, what, do I, what, you know, what... And the framework of the Environmental Health cl Clinic, the framework of the ooze, I mean, these aren't, these aren't gestural. They're actually about setting up alternative institutions and using the, you know, if you will, pirating the medical model, which, you know, if you think about it, what can you take on a plane with you? You can't take your shampoo. You can't take your, <laughs> you know, your um, tweezers. You can only take things under doctor's orders, right? That's the only liquids you can actually carry with you now. I mean, is there any rationale about that? No, it's the exercise of what authority works now, what gives you the capacity, what gives you any, any tread. And um, so strategically, finding what frameworks kind of fulfill um, and extend our own agency, I think, is, is the job. And I would have to agree that a kind of a conflictual struggle um, you know, is, is I, th I think you summarized it, you know, <laughs> Che Guevara is, is, he's a fashion item, right? He's not, um, he's not really, uh, you know, s leading a revolution. His, his memory is more of a stylistic um, appropriation. So, so that's why, you know, I think interrogating what particular, you know, what strategy, and so, and so I, I want to say one other thing on this aspect, because I think it's, something we all struggle with. And this idea of a, of a lifestyle experiment, right, which is another um, framework that I'm really trying to understand and articulate is really important for actually one of the reasons you said um, it's demonstrative, right? Being demonstrative, making the garden happen, um, being demonstrative, you know, drinking out of a a glass jar, reused, reused mm. um, jars, have a, a power that is um, very different from the traditions of organizing um, consensus generation and other kind of strategies for resistance and alterity that we've kind of exhausted. So I think um, these lifestyle experiments, they cordon off an area where you can actually say, I'm trying something new, I'm not committed to it yet, I'm figuring it out, but um, 
So the struggle has been kind of recast as something more, you know, I'm figuring this out. I don't know the answers. I don't know what we're heading for, but I'm prepared to try a few things that are unusual and um, non-standard and are generative. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a struggle. I with guerrilla gardening in, in particular, there's there's the struggle against the authorities, whether it's the police turning up and threatening one with arrest, which I'm, I'm glad to say is a very rare occurrence for me and for most people. So quite literally, yes, that there is confrontation, um, and with the authorities and the landowners, there's confusion um, as to how to uh, deal with us, because on the one hand, people would like to make use of the voluntary um, labor on the other hand they don't want to take responsibility for health and safety and insurance matters so there's there's that side of it in, in terms of why i use the word gorilla and uh, continue to and and use other words from uh, military language whether it's um, seed bombs or um, land mining with bulbs uh, explosions of color etc etc well um, there is the, the 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 fashion side of it but Beyond that, which frankly uh, embarrasses me a little, but I have to admit, uh, it's powerful language. I'm trying to get an idea across, and I'm comfortable with appropriating that, particularly in times of uh, heightened conflict elsewhere in the world. I think using that in, in this context um, is deliberately provocative. But in the case of gardening, it's particularly relevant, because any gardener... Um, an experienced gardener sees gardening um, as a battle. Enjoying the garden is a wonderfully peaceful activity, but if you're going in there imposing your vision of what you want on the landscape, whether that is with very sensitive methods using native species and adopting permaculture approaches, you're still imposing what you want on the landscape and working both with and against natural forces, whether those are invasive species, insects, the wind, rain. Um, it is a creative and uh, destructive process. Um, so to me, gardening and warfare um, are, are very comfortable um, languages, pools of words to play around with. And it gets the message across. I, I, I'm without doubt, if guerrilla gardening wasn't called guerrilla gardening, if we were called the radical rhizomes, like they nearly were, um, the idea wouldn't be as popular as it is now. Well, there's, there's a rhizome network. <laughs> there is, I know, yes. There, 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 is, there is sort of a, a rhizomatic discourse. Yes. <laughs> In Texas. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I, I wanted to comment on, on Michiko's intervention there because I happened to be in a class at RCA when she was working on this before her graduation. And, you know, what you're seeing there is like the unmistakable mark of Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby and their, you know, their, their, their school of, 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 you know, RCA, Royal College of Art, sort of design interventionist whimsy. <laughs> and, you know, I have to say that I'm really in their corner. I mean, I'm a science fiction writer, and these are people in design whose practice is about as close to science fiction as you can get. And kind of, you know, a mildly left interventionist kind of perspective, you know, at least, you know, common for sort of London creative types. And, you know, no, they're not going to go out and throw a brick in a cop's face. I mean, they're not street fighters. They're not Guevara. They're not Mao Zedong. I find them more interesting for that fact rather than less. And if you're really, really interested in violent armed struggle right now, you don't have to look any farther than Athens. You know, the town's on fire, right? I mean, the kids are out there with freaking concrete blocks. They're like taking it to the streets. Now, they're having pitched battles with the cops. There's tear glass all over the place. They're setting fire to cars, you know, uh, and they're really angry. And, you know, and I don't doubt that the young people in Greece have as much reason for radical anger as anybody in France in 1968 or anybody in London in 1977 and probably, you know, anybody in Eastern Europe in 89. I just don't think they're going to get anywhere. I don't think they're going to get anywhere except, you know, broken arms and, you know, the broken arms of police and, you know, a lot of material damage and, you know, a kind of ruin of the reputation of Greece as sort of a nice place to hang out and have an ouzo. You know, I don't see the point, quite frankly. You know, and I, and I say this as like a 
style punk guy. I mean, I know what, what that was about. You know, and, and I've hung out with people in Eastern Europe, too, you know, who really engage in a social revolution. And, you know, I, I completely agree with Renee that it's like, it's become boring to describe revolutionaries as some kind of homo universalis figure. That's just not what they are. And I further agree with him that this discourse that they had, you know, these, these, these uh, you know, urban, uh, urban gloom prophets of the period, they really were trying to refit the description and the behavior of people in the streets as haute couture, haute culture, New York literary intellectuals demanding a quiet space where their erudition would be respected, you know? And I wouldn't say I'm tired of it, I mean, you know, Hannah Arendt is a very interesting historical figure. <laughs> you know, she's not the, uh, you know, the be-all and end-all, and I don't think she has a whole lot to say to the century at this point. I mean, some, like Origins of Totalitarianism, very interesting book. Her insight that evil has the face of banality, that's like a very interesting insight. But, you know, you don't combat the evil face of banality by going out and, like, setting fire to a lot of material goods. And I really think is a more useful attack on the evil face of banality by going out and doing one of these Dun and Raby style, I don't know, design situationist pranks. I mean, we don't really have a discussion, we don't have a good set of terminologies for what it was that they did to their student there, but that excites me. It's like a new set of culture war mistakes. You know, I mean, it's a little bit like 68 or situationist detourment or some kind of provo pranksterism from the early, you know, 80s in Holland. I mean, you see bits of stuff, little sort of hints of it, fragments of it. As Renee says, I don't think it's the be all and the end all, but it strikes me as a place where we ought to be putting creative energy. You know, really. I mean, rather than rehashing these, you know, situations that made us miserable. I mean, there's sort of two choices in re revolutionary struggle. Either you lose, in which case you've radically dynamized the right-wing culture war, people, you know, the forces of reaction who are now radicalized and feel completely justified in anything they do, culturally, economically, or whatever, or you win, in which case you need to start a new form of life, right? I mean, you need to take power and actually govern and come up with like policies people are going to agree with <coughs> that like actually enable them to get on <coughs> with their with their everyday lives you know so you know where's the victory condition there i mean a certain number of people need to be doing lifestyle experiments they need to be doing demonstrations we should respect them for what they are and when they do something that's a hit we should get out of the way and like let it blossom and move and, and the suicide environmentalism thing is like, that's our original sin, you know? I mean, that's just like, that's like the class mistake of the counterculture. It's like, I'm too hip to live, so I think I'll, you know, do my last guitar solo, choke on my vomit and die, you know? It's just so, I mean, that is the banality, really. I mean, it's the sort of romantic agony thing I'm too perfect to live for 80 years. I don't want to be old, live fast, die young, leave a beautiful corpse. It's just like, get over yourself. You're not, your corpse is not that beautiful. You're not that pretty. Your ideas are not that good. You know, um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just reject that with every fiber of my being. Right, there is also um, something going on, on at the moment in Italy, which is not quite Greece, but it's also not quite Royal <coughs> College, which is, as you know, called the Anomalous Wave, right? right. Which is a movement of... Well, uh, the, the kids are in the street all over Torino right now. They're having the, you know, the college funds are being cut and, and all. I mean, the right is in power in Italy. And you know, these are not, I mean, we're not in for pretty times here. You know, I mean, the financial crisis is really pretty bad. but. It is the mildest and sort of the gentlest kind of major crisis you can have, as opposed to like an epidemic, an earthquake, a world war, or whatever. It's just sort of a mass vote that sort of says, okay, the way we're going about paying for stuff doesn't make any sense. Well, it's true. I mean, the way we go about paying for stuff doesn't make any sense. And our economic s s s you know, system is unsustainable. We're kind of lucky it's cracking up this early. 
as opposed to when it's like squeeze the last drop of living blood out of our veins. No, I mean, it's like the slate is suddenly wiped clean. The rich have panicked, for Christ's sake. The people at the top of the heap lost confidence. You know, they've immolated themselves. <coughs> you know, and w without a shot being fired. You know, it's not because the left talked them into it. They just plain lost their nerve. They just dropped the ball, you know, in public. I mean, they just blew it. You know, it's just really kind of amazing to see. And, and you know, in a lot of ways, a, heart, a heartening sign, unless you happen to be super wealthy. Do you dare to, to add anything to that? What uh, I say yeah, after exactly. This? Uh, you, you said it all, baby. Um, maybe in a reaction to both of you, um, uh, because I think that uh, you both gave uh, perfect examples of what, it, wh wh what has changed in our conception of politics. We, wh when we look at this old-fashioned uh, struggle or old-fashioned re resistance, it always ended up in visions of order. So it started with uh, mayhem on the streets, but behind the mayhem there was a very universal, generalized conception of a new order. Well, we have reached that new order. We are living in it. Uh, some, some call it democracy, others give it other names. And we have to do something with that democracy, and we really don't know what. That's our problem. And then you two introduced, in fact, different, completely different notions of uh, politics as a form of design or redesigning. Uh, redesigning that comes very close to what I defined as a shift uh, in discussions about ordering the public sphere in cities to uh, 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 redesigning or uh, discussing the design of uh, the public sphere in cities from an everyday life standpoint, from, from the standpoint, from the pragmatic standpoint or phenomenological standpoint, which asks the questions, how are we dealing at the moment with it? And what is wrong and what is good uh, about the way we deal with it? This experience, this experience of a, uh, of a certain continuity in the, in the way we have dealt with our environment is, is lost to a certain extent. And in politics, it's never about that experience. It's always about ordering top down or uh, somewhere in the middle uh, before asking the question of, uh, of, uh, of these experiences. And in these experiences, all kinds of technologies are operating and are doing things that are difficult for us to envision uh, uh, yet in, in, in a proper manner. And I think experimenting with this redesigning of urban environment is the beginning of a new type of politics. You may call it top-down, bottom-up, but it's no, not always bottom-up. It's, it's sometimes it's, it's, it's big companies who, who cooperate with you. Sometimes it's, it's the, the local administration that's taken over. Well, you gave a, a few examples. Sometimes you have to struggle. Sometimes you have to go illegal. Sometimes you have to go underground even. And, and a lot of even economic elements of our everyday uh, urban experience are in the gray zones, in the informal economy, and, and everywhere, uh, uh, but not in the, in the official uh, visible uh, part of the economy. I think that is, uh, I, I don't know who, who had said it, but some Canadian uh, 20 years ago said, uh, I never understood the, the, our concept of freedom. Freedom is a terrible thing. Freedom is the thing we always have to solve every day. We have to do something with our freedom. We don't know what. No, and that's completely different from the way in the 68 or in the, uh, the sec first half of this uh, 20th century, we debated about freedom. We was, there was freedom, something we wanted to reach. And we reached out for that freedom. And maybe uh, the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall was something, the last, uh, the last moment of, of a, a type of reaching a freedom like that. But we are living in freedom and we have to do something. So, did you say it? It's also banal or, well, that's what you feel when somebody says, I want to be free. Shut up, you're free already. Yeah. Do something with it. Yeah, what are you going to do exactly? Yeah. And how do you manifest that? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I, 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 I saw something what you said earlier about the sort of, you know, a philosophy of new urbanity and how, to s how cities are taking the lead in this. And, no, I, I'm, I'm very keen on that, and you know, I, I think it's true, and I think cities are kind of the engines of globalization, and they're sort of much, much closer to the things that are really defining <coughs> contemporary politics than the nation state is. You know, the nation state is very useful because it's sort of the, the resource of civil rights, it's the, you know, it's the backbone of the legal system, and so forth. And I'm thinking what would be really, really handy right now would be one nation state, just one, willing to kick over the Westphalian system, you know? I mean, just like one traitor nation state, one useful idiot country, 
is kind of say, you know, we are just sort of a big global place now and sort of we're going to get rid of a lot of this clutter, you know, and just sort of redefine ourselves as, you know, a global <coughs> new 21st century entity. I mean, they'd have to, they'd have to really, you know, could be Dubai. I mean, Iceland. you know, could Iceland. be, Iceland. Could, you know, my my suspicion, yeah, my suspicion, it, it, it could be Iceland. You know, somebody yeah. just freaking <laughs> gives up. It won't be a superpower. It won't be anybody with an established military. Probably somebody who's already selling their postage stamps. You know, it could be a Singapore, a Vatican City. Uh, you know, some a breakaway chunk of Belgium that hasn't redefined itself as any kind of some frozen conflict region that just sort of says, look, we're tired of other nation states jerking us around. I mean, somebody who's got something to gain by it and sort of has enough pull to like define themselves as a, you know, as a contemporary, I mean, nation state's not the word for it. I don't think we've invented the word for the kind of political entity we really need. But, but it's like we have a good idea of how we want to live and we just, we don't have the proper instruments by which to carry out our agency. Can I, can I just actually um, focus in, I think, on, on one retrievable area of struggle, um, which I think really counts. And that's a struggle for truth or truth claims or who gets to be true, who gets to have kind of real reliable knowledge and I, you know and and so there's politics and then there's truth there's strategy political strategies and then there's kind of uh, persuasive strategies and um, and I think you know John Dewey was kind of very focused str strangely enough um, on the capacity for citizens or people to have an engagement with scientific kind of standards of evidence as part and uh, you know, absolutely, um, prior to being able to participate in the parti what you know, we come to call participatory democracies, and I'm really interested in why that counts because when we think about the kind of the urgency in which the natural systems have, and how health and you know our major institutional context, zoos, you know, incarcerating animals, those little putting little labels on them, giraffe, elephants, you know, seeing none of the interactions that go on, cross-species interactions, none of the territorial resource management, none of the, we learn nothing from zoos, nothing that we need to learn from zoos. I mean, they're total kind of collections, pageantry, leftover appendages, institutional appendages from, from you know, royal uh, kind of collections. And, 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 and how, you know, what do they do, right? What do they don't, you know, they, 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 so who gets to, organize how we relate to animals? Who gets to say what's important? Um, and why, why are we kind of captured within these kind of um, long ago kind of um, bankrupt institutions? How do we kind of reinvent them? Or, you know, I, I think the case with health, and I want to come back to again that, because it's something we all, <coughs> it's ours, right? Um, more than anything else, the idea of your own health, right, as being something you manage, you are in control of that, you know, you might go to a doctor and get a prescription or, you know, but whether you smoke or you what you eat or, you know, these are kind of your decisions. That's something you have agency over and to what extent that gets manipulated and sold back to you and in your gym memberships and your supplements and your, you know, health insurance um, and where one can resist and change and think that through. I mean, I think the stakes are, are really high in this, and I, I think it's worth understanding that there's struggle about what counts as true, what one can eat, how one can eat, what is, what is good for you, you know, how one can act, that that's where there's some retrievable idea of a kind of struggle in which we can all play a very you know, critical role. Whereas the kind of the traditional kind of being part of a political mass or a social movement, as it's as they appear on the streets and is, uh, you know, is is a much it's much harder to figure out why that works or doesn't. What I'm just wondering is whether the um, the power that that stands between the um, idea or the, the you know the concept of you know we have to do 
uh, we, you know, we want to uh, live healthier, we want to do this and this and that, and actually, you know, the actual agency, I mean, you know, the, the power that stands, in you know, in between those two things, I mean, I, I, I wonder, I mean, it certainly evolved since uh, 68, but I mean, has it qualitatively changed? I mean, that's, uh, I mean, we can always say, well, you know, this is the struggle, this is old stuff, you know, we, want, we don't want to smash things, of course we don't, you know. But what is a constructive way of, uh, of, of, of confronting, you know, these, these uh, discourses, these very pragmatic neoliberal uh, 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 machines that, that we are up against um, today? But, uh, but um, what I would also like is to open up the discussion to, uh, to the audience, and, um, and Rene has to leave. Uh, so um, Sorry, but uh, I have to go. Thank you very much. All right, um, shoot. Yeah, I'm kind of, uh, kind of missing a recent development, actually, in the whole story. If we're talking about struggle and the traditional revolutionary who would fight and then literally fight the system, break it down, and then, well, having to build something else, which usually comes down to a new top-down system. Um, and how well, what to struggle against and how to go about this. There's this new um, development in England uh, called Transition Towns, where um, basically this is the bottom-up thing we're talking about. Th this is communities, dwellings, neighborhoods of big urban areas who as a neighborhood, as a community decide like, hey, we, we've got climate change, we've got peak oil, we've got this oil and climate crisis coming up. How are we gonna deal as a community? Is it gonna be looting after three days? or uh, h how is this crisis gonna come and how are we gonna prepare ourselves for this? And then they just make this 20 year step plan and they uh, in 20 years build down their CO2 emissions. In 20 years they build up a community that can feed of their own local resources. Uh, they just make a plan for education, transport, food, uh, architecture, everything uh, for a post oil age. Um, and this is actually uh, going quite fast. It's, it's in England, there's 33, or oh actually more than 33 official transition towns and over, than ho over 140 being found. And even all over the world, it's actually uh, growing. This, and this is a community movement. Um, yeah, I was kind of missing this uh, because it's, it's, it's a big thing and it's happening. Anybody know about them? Yeah, yeah. no, I've, I've spoken with them and um, I, I think there's a lot of great thing obviously going on with transition towns because it is about getting communities t t together and, and making a, 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 a difference against um, a range of issues, whether it's, it's oil, which is very much the focus of the movement, or, or just a lack of participation. Um, and I'd just like to go back a step. In terms of power and perhaps how it's changed and, and what we're struggling against, I, I would sidestep that slightly and say actually um, it's apathy amongst um, the general population that's the, the, the biggest problem to change, an acceptance of how things are, or, or, or at worst, an acceptance that, oh, we can't really change much, so um, let's, let's just carry on like we are. And that, that whatever issue um, one's campaigning for, um, or, or whether that's about environmental issues or health issues or equality issues, I think that is the, the biggest thing we're up against. And what transition towns uh, have done really well is work out um, how to get whole communities each, each well, w working together but helping out each other. And, and um, There's a long way to go though. And, and I think I, I'd like to say one, one final thing about Transition Town which is a bit worrying. Um, and and I, I found that the, the guy I met actually um, full of a lot of um, negativity um, and, and anger um, which, which luckily isn't the, the, the usual face of the movement. Um, and, and I think that where it could potentially head, because the focus is so much on a post-oil economy, is a sort of neo-medievalism of these independent little towns. Perhaps, if, perhaps this is the ultimate localization, where towns are completely self-sufficient, pulling up the drawbridge, we've got our resources, we've got it sorted here, guys. You know, we've got our well and our, our citadel and our little field. Um, you sort yourself out, you know, drawbridge is up. And, and th that's worrying. Um, and it is very English. 
um, the, the Englishman's you know, home is his castle. Um, and I, I think that what I would hope to see in the movement and what uh, I, I try and emphasize with guerrilla gardening is the, the global nature of it, the diversity, the things we can all learn from each other. I, I don't believe in, in the extreme green gorillas approach of not emailing. I think it's a communications and sharing things across boundaries um, is really, really important. Even though when you come to the environment, it's simplistic and easy to think of it as my patch of land, my plot, and our sort of sustainability within our little patch. But ecosystems are more complicated than that. You can't, you can't actually live in a biosphere like people were imagining in the 70s. Unless you really like cockroaches and crazy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Have you yeah. ever been to that place, Natalie? Yeah, we've, just, we've got yeah. great videos. Yeah, I've, I've been there. I was there when it was a going concern back in the day when it was being founded by Texan Mars cultists, Johnny, Johnny Dolphin and his, his <laughs> groups of pals. I mean, you know, there, there's a Southern Gothic retribution thing going on in there because here you had this sort of gorgeous counterculture tinged thing where, you know, I mean, it was really grouped by, I mean, the biosphere was built by a cult, you know, a Texan cult of people who really, their, their agenda was to build a Martian colony on the surface of the planet, and they had a, uh, they had as their, as their patron this wealthy Texan oil man um, who was willing to finance their fantasies to the extent of, you know, several tens of millions of dollars. So, you know, they actually built a sort of home Martian tinker toy as a kind of, you know, of, uh, proof of concept, you know, and moved in and promptly fell over from oxygen starvation. I mean, they're just, it's very, very hard to keep a biosphere alive. If you've ever seen these little biospheres, the small ones, they'd be better named fanatospheres. I mean, they just, they kind of choke to death on their own refuse in, in pretty short order. So, you know, as I grow older, I get more interested in long-term things. I mean, that's why I'm more interested in this sort of 20-year survival scheme of slow food than I am in some new scheme to evade the mostly theoretical peak oil apocalypse. I mean, I would predict these guys are going to have a lot of management problems. They're going to have severe political secession problems. Um, I'd be very impressed if the slow food movement can outlast the death or disinterest of Petrini. I don't think he has a succession plan in line. I mean, there's not a constitution there. It's not really a political party. It really is kind of, I don't know, a very typical kind of social movement surround, you know, centered around a charismatic pop guru figure. And, you know, that's very, very problematic. You know, it's like being the world's biggest Jimmy Page fan and then having Led Zeppelin break up. I was like, gee, my life is over. Okay, they were a rock band, you know. You can't really nail your colors to the mast there. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of fait accompli developments that are basically revolutionary without any of the traditional flag waving. Like people in Torino, one of the areas that, one of the things that the city that interests me most is that they had an automobile based auto financial collapse in the 70s, really, in the years of lead. They pulled the Detroit, a third of the population left. Everybody went broke. There was severe civil disorder. People were being kneecapped. The population was in the streets. They just couldn't manage it. That was about 25 years ago. Now you go to Torino, you see these weird hybrid architectural interventions where you know, assembly plants become boutique areas. People are selling flowers and chocolate out of areas where they used to jam fiats together. This is what the mid-21st century really looks like. It's living in the shell of the 20th in the way that like the early 20th was living in the shell of the Victorian construction boom. And really, there's, there's too much of it to knock down. The, the, the frontier is, I hate to say it, the white fungus. The white fungus is the true frontier. It's the stuff that's useless. It's the stuff that can't be made any use of, the stuff you can get for a dollar because you might have some use for it. You know? And you're going to see a lot of ingenuity. I mean, just weird things are going to happen in those spaces. Cardboard igloos, you know, things made out of foam, uh, bizarre digital architectural kind of things, but all hidden. You know? 
inside these membranes and seashells, kind of a hermit crab like existence. You're going to go in there and they're going to be like selling Nollywood videos. It's going to be full of, you know, Nigerian emigres married to 14th generation Dutch Chinese Surinamese internet development people. Just, you know, you know, and, and the tidal wave of that is going to be bigger than, you know, and people are just going to vote with their feet. And in turn, you can see them do it. You know, in my neighborhood, there's like a Bollywood retail outlet and a Nollywood store right down the street. I mean, you know, it's just this strange place. Um, you know, and I, I don't, I mean, the, the ruins of the 20th century are the genuine frontier. And I don't think we have, I mean, what we really need is like a way to make those ruins live. Well, I, 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 I think some of the presentations today gave us an interesting uh, sort of, uh, well, not a major trajectory, but some you know, small trajectories. I mean, what this symposium is the, the first event in, in a series called Life and Art. And I mean, what is life if not, you know, some, some sort of organization of connections, of relations, right? And, and I mean, some of these possible relations or sort of new relations or sort of the invention of... Uh, of new relations, I, I think we've we've seen today also in Mikito's uh, um, um, film. I, I don't think it's about saying you know you shouldn't use email, but it's about sort of exploring, right? New 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 relations, and and, and the same is true for for, for Natalie's uh, uh, presentation. I mean, you know, no, I mean, no medievalism, neo medievalism is not the answer. I mean, I, I think sort of high tech, uh, high tech greening or whatever you know you want to you want to call it. I mean, that's that's what we need. You know, we need to get rid of this uh, obsolete uh, 20th century technology, or we can't get rid of it, yeah? but we have to build sort of new relations on, 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 on top of it. And, but then again, you know, the question of power comes up, you know, because you know, there are, of course, big corporations who are interested or not very interested in exploring this stuff. I mean, there might be more interest, but I mean, look at, at the European Union, you know, what, what these German, uh, 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 um, what are they called, um, um, Lobbyists, right? They are called. Uh, uh, have done within the space of like a week. I mean, they they have, they have they have uh, postponed this sort of carbon emission uh, cap, you know, by by I don't know what ten years or something like that. I mean, amazing, you know, within within no time, right? I mean, instead of sort of using this this crisis as a, as a catalyzer for for technological change, you know, uh, well, you know, they are, they have got real power. Well, that's, that's not a permanent victory. On no, no, of course not. It's not. It's not. But I mean, I'm just saying, you know, there are real powers that we cannot sort of fantasize away. But that does not mean that we shouldn't fantasize. I mean, or develop. You know, I don't want to go to the mattress on this, but, you know, big corporations in the United States are objects of pity right now. Right. Yeah. They're, not, they're not looming, massive, chrome plated things right. with reel to reel tape computers. If you're like a guy in the United States, who like did everything the establishment told you to do and you have a brown shoe and a tie and you've spent 30 years at IBM and you expected to sort of retire to South Florida and be taken care of, you're done, man. You're like done over to, to, to an extent that's like hard to describe. I mean, you're as badly off as a, as a communist app ratchet, you know, in like 90, 91. I mean, you know, it's ugly. I mean, it's like really ugly, and, and you know the idea that these sort of enormous pasteboard three initial outfits are still supposed to terrify us when they're like broker than any companies have ever been broke before. I mean, am I, who am I supposed to be afraid of here? General Motors? They've got a baking ball. Who? AT and T? You know? I mean, who who's the bogeyman here? I mean, maybe the Republican Party, but they were just run out of the country on a rail. I mean. <laughs> Who, who is it? I mean, who's the they? You know, I, I mean, I'd rather be the they. You know, I, I just, you know, why am I wasting my energy? on, you know, I mean, yeah, there's going to be a lot of difficulty. Um, you know, and there, there's certainly going to be all kinds of amazing political skullduggery in a society that that radically destabilized. But geez, the American situation is, you know, it's looking like a transition economy, basically. You know, and we're in the position of like Russian dissidents who are like, gee, they're not arresting us anymore. I, I, I wish I could get somebody to fight against. Who, the <laughs> WTO? You know, the WTO is on the rails. There's nobody there. Davos Four, if you go and talk to the rich people in the world, they're like completely disorganized. I mean, just like in total fear. 
And what paranoid entity are we supposed to conjure up? I don't know, who? Bankers of Zurich? Uh, I mean, who's the bad guy? I mean, the you know, the I mean, fact that there is no bad guy doesn't make it you know, easier. Well, you know, there, there, are pro there are problems with a, you know, a corporate existence and sort of commodity totalitarianism and so forth, but I just don't think that discourse is going to get us anywhere. Oh, no. I mean, if you're going like, to go out in the street tomorrow, you're, you're really much better off throwing magnolia seeds. <laughs> You know, I mean, really, <laughs> instead of going in and saying, you know, I'm really sick of McDonald's. Okay, you know, McDonald's has been in decline for many years. They're not the golden version of, you know, a successful multinational company. Um, you know, anti-Americanism, I'm all for it. You know, whether there's any point to it when the thing, you know, it's like being anti-communist. What? You know, I mean, what? It's like, oh, I'm out to crush Stalinism. Why? You know? I mean, it's kind of done. I mean, what you need is like a reason to get out of bed in the morning and do something useful. Um, well, shall we see if there's, yeah, there's Matteo over there and there's a, another question here. Someone else? Shall we probably collect a few questions and only those two? Do you want to start, Matteo? Yeah, sorry for going back to the intestinal flora. I have some question about the relation between art and life, art and design and food. And because, yeah, as Bruce told, uh, said before, this stuff has been always around. I mean, uh, many people doesn't know, don't know how the intestinal flora work, how we make beer, bread, how we produce alcohol, how vodka is produced, what's the ecology of this wonderful molecule that's the ethanol, the alcohol, even in the, in our, in the ecology of our body. And um, I would like to, yeah, uh, to, to say that probably traditional cooking, traditional cuisine has a higher biotech know-how than many bio artists today that they know about all this micro invisible uh, organism around other part of a kind of, yeah, very invisible ecology. I will, I will make an example about this kind of design approach. One of the other uh, very hip cuisine today is the molecular cuisine by Adrien Ferrat where they took this know-how from chemistry and they apply it to food. They take the apple, they construct the apple, and they reconstruct the apple. But they don't touch the living matter, the, the actual life of the apple or this any kind of carrot, animal, how it's produced. On the other side, even, yeah, food design is very, it's a question about the design even in the Netherlands, because the approach to food here in the Netherlands is very design-oriented. And even the uh, lunch we had today um, about urban resources. I asked if the urban ingredients were involved, actually, where the stuff was coming, and no one was a urban ingredient. It was a kind of act of deception, because simply <laughs> it was a design gesture. We organized some dinner with urban ingredients in Amsterdam. It was very difficult. It's difficult, and some people tried some urban <laughs> cabbage, and it's, it's, they're quite, yeah, sometimes it'd be quite unpleasant. But yeah, my question is how, do we have something else apart from design to touch the living matter, apart from software, genetics, chemistry, how to deal with the living matter, with the food? I mean, yeah, it's a very conservative statement to go back to the traditional cuisine and their know-how, this ancestral knowledge. Well, I can tell you what I would most like to see. What I'd really like to see at this point is some kind of Arduino-controlled, open-source, urban window box garden. Right? Because I travel a lot, I don't. I certainly don't have time to sit around, you know, with the opportunity cost and the cognitive loading of growing things in Italy. But you know, I'm living in Italy, and like everybody else has got like these incredibly cool window boxes, which are being sort of run by elderly retired women who sort of come in and you know, pour things over them. I don't think that's beyond the ability of like people in this room to build. Like any competent electronic artist could build a small workable, digitized, urban garden, you know, and just put this stuff in it, you know, and, you, you, and sure you could throw it onto the side of the road and leave it and hope if it comes all right or not, but why not just like automate the things that I put in a big jug and some little sprinklers in there and some, you know, physical computing, drive the cost down through open source to the, you know, point where it's cheaper than coat hangers and just staple them on the outsides of buildings. 
right? Well, we've published one of those at the Environment Health Clinic, well, and there's I'm, a number I'm, of problems I'm, I'm associated with it. I'm keen to it. have that's one. You know, I'm like in the market. I mean, show me one, and I'll publicize but it. it. But I'll I, put I, it I, on I, my <laughs> blog. We can all buy one tomorrow. Just mail order the sons of bitches. We'll put them on Etsy. We'll put them on Pinoco. You know, we'll just like make it happen. Bunsy's watering can there. Could we have <laughs> Natalie sort of finish her? Yeah, because I, I you know, I think w uh, one of the um, uh, food is obviously this uh, this very visceral system that we um, can relate to and that crosses culture and material and energy in ways that nothing else can quite do. And yet there is a demand for, and you know, I've spent the last three years working on the Cross Species Cookbook, as I mentioned, with a great um, um, artist, Deborah Solomon, who's um, really <laughs> um, helping to produce the kind of research that I do into um, edible, you know, adventures for the palate, but the um, but the main function, and I think this is this is one of the, the to in answer to your question, is is really to understand the cross species cookbook is food that's delicious and nutritious to humans and non humans, right? The fact that we eat the same stuff as geese largely, right, is extraordinarily um, novel to many people, right? We depend on the same resources and and the urgency is you know do we need another star chef do we need you know the sl uh, the slow food movement has uh, has um, created many opportunities for um, uh, sens sensual investigation that really have you know made careers of farmers but has it <coughs> to, to what extent can it reinvigorate and change our relationship to natural systems. To s um, so, so one example is the the um, the function of the bees, um, and the culinary collapse disorder. Oh, sorry, the colony collapse disorder, which um, could be called the culinary deprivation disorder, uh, because um, in fact African beekeepers have used um, lemongrass, right, as a, um, a mite control um, uh, strategy. Um, that um, that has, has uh, and as you know, lemongrass is a tea. It's kind of essential ingre ingredient in in um, in Thai food. It's the citronella in insect repe uh, repellent because for mites and uh, it acts as a sexual pheromone and confuses them. They don't know what to screw and and um, so they leave the bees alone. And the kind of exploration into um, the molecular gastronomy of animals takes us a little bit further than mo the molecular gastronomy of the kitchens of Parisian and English um, intellectuals, and actually can be, I think, very productive. In this case, um, uh, lemongrass treatments of uh, colonies that have collapsed have been the most remarkably effective thing. So hence, they're now called colon whatever. Colony collapse disorder, co colony culinary deprivation is now the the um, the retitle. So it can it can move, but I do think we have the power to take a point of view that is not human centric, and uh, you know it's one of the capacities that we have, um, and that that's enormously productive, right? It's enormously generative. Uh, it changes how we what counts how our systems are measured, what they're measured by. And you know, it, there's, there's the nostalgia and the tradition which will always be there and always be great to, m to mind, but there's not only that. I think there's, there's ways to, to really explore vast new territories, tongue first. Last question. Uh, well, yeah, no, I'm, um, I was just reacting to the previous discussion about uh, the, the, the future and the enemy or the, the um, it's a very general image which I don't know fits really into this, the, 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 the turn the discussion uh, took, but it's uh, by a book by T.C. Boyle about Friends of the Earth, which uh, ends with a, a very nice a vision of the future, which is not, is frightening because it's uh, not very uh, apocalyptic. It's just like a, a, a future where wind is blowing all the time and um, everything is very muddy and, and the only people making money are the people who are, uh, who are uh, the companies that, that uh, um, hammer uh, and, and nail things 
uh, to the floor or to the to the houses, uh, because that's the uh, and otherwise it's it's sort of disintegrating and it's just, uh, this slow disintegrating uh, disintegration that's maybe the the, the frightening image. Uh, so you want to speed up uh, 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 ways of of dealing with uh, the, the, the the ecological problems uh, um, and and. Uh well, all these uh, things that were discussed, the social uh, embed embedding of, of, of solutions that go uh, and, and um, re-establishing uh, um, connections with nature, I think are very much, um, uh, I always think of them in that perspective. That I mean, it's not going to be apocalyptic, but it's just going to be a boring future if you don't try to uh, explore these possibilities, uh, like you name, with uh, becoming more... Um, Working with more with natural systems in a smart way, understanding them. I, I don't believe so much in high tech, uh, but that's a personal opinion. But it can be something of a solution, but there's always it's always going to um, break down at a point uh, unless you decentralize it very much, make networks. Um, so um, uh, can I pick up on that one thing because I think there's a very important please, issue yeah, because about I'm the. I'm um, <laughs> Uh, particularly in the agricultural movement, there's almost always and already a rejection of GMOs, a rejection of, you know, petrochemically produced um, fertilizers, and a rejection of any kind of scientific practice in, in yield production. And I, th and, and I think this is a mistake, right? This is a really tremendous mistake. What went wrong with the Green Revolution is many things. Some things went right with it. I mean, having half the Indian cotton farmers and all the Australian cotton farmers suicide from, from ingesting um, <laughs> their um, uh, fertilizers is a tragic end result and certainly indicts the, the technology that they're using. But what it actually indicts is not the technology itself but it the structure of participation of who controls, how it was, what kind of debt they went into, no, you can't throw uh, so th the issue of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, where all GMOs are bad, or you know all kinds of technical. I mean, with urban urban gardening, it's just a fantasy to say that we can use very traditional practices without having to reinvent. You know, you've got land that is not only the highest value; it's also tremendously um, unconditioned soil. It's, you know, you're trying to get high yield. You're, um, you, and that land is, you know, of all the community gardens and all the urban gardens in, in Manhattan, if they're on, on the ground, they're temporarily there at best. You know, two or three of these urban gardens have survived from the, um, the 70s, you know, and they, they move around. I mean, the pressure, but the pressure on them to kind of, to move, to change, to, you know, is enormous. <coughs> so that so that you, you, so I would argue that you can't say that all technology belongs to corporations and is necessarily bad, but it can be seized and rethought, and particularly with an integrity, the kinds of things that s the slow move, uh, movement um, talks about, which is not a rejection of technologies, but a rejection of a certain kind of concentrated power and profit that structures participation in a way to exclude and devalue. Um, human labor and intuition and local knowledge. So, so there's a there's a complex relationship there that um, that I would I beg you to consider that all technology is not <laughs> by definition bad technology in the movement towards rethinking our urban fabric. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of a group uh, uh, promoting urban agriculture in Rotterdam. And we also our strategy is very much at looking at different uh, um, uh, um, different levels and, and and try to decentralize it, have small uh, business opportunities, but also think of, of high tech combinations of, of different uh, crops, and also uh, uh, use unexpected places like on on rooftops uh, as well as roadsides and and, and and sort of unacknowledged sp uh, spaces and temporary spaces that are belong to that. Um, and I think you can make many uh, many smart co uh, uh, combinations uh, there. That's uh right. But I think I think smart combinations is a good sort of uh, uh, notion to end this mm. uh, symposium on. And uh, <laughs> the the important thing is that that the smart combination lies, I mean, ahead of us, right? I mean, the, the seeds you know are in the in the present, but I mean the. Uh, 
the the full body, the sort of the 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 the, the, org the, um, the, the, the organism, right? We we only find at the tip of the the arrow of time, of uh, the tip of kairos, eh? uh, and not in some sort of romanticism uh, uh, or you know some sort of green. Um, fundamentalism. Uh, thank, thanks uh, to the speakers. Thanks a lot. I, I mean, that was a very engaging, very, very, very interesting uh, 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 a day. And uh, thank you all for coming. And um, uh, we'll see you at the next uh, event, I suppose. Yes, let's say uh, a few words on the continuation. Um, shouldn't be in front of the speakers. Um, we are closing down now the session here. We're going up to have a more informal, loose, how do you call it, end session with uh, uh, some snacks and drinks. Um, the continuation of the project will be in very diverse format. So today we had a more or less a kind of a conference, but within the life and uh, art series, there will also be workshops, there will be a book, a book publication, there will be several formats that we will more or less try to research the topics that we have laid out. So this was the starting point. There's a few of the things that has been said today that we will evaluate and see how we can take it in into the next step. So we, we don't have already a pre-planned, how do you call it, research trajectory. We more follow law, uh, law more or less also what's coming out of each of the presentations or each of the events that we set up. Um, for now, I would like to thank all the people who participated today in the presentations. I think uh, it was an inspiring day. There's a lot of topics actually uh, uh, that have been uh, set and have been touched. I think if you take the booklet with you, uh, there is links also in it, so you can look back, pick up the things that have been said. Um, next to thanking the speakers, I would like to thank the whole crew actually here who did the production, who has been taking care of that we could do this event, that we could stream it out uh, to people who have been online. So thanks everybody who is all in the back that you even can't see, you only can see uh, Richard all the time, but there's a crew up there also on top. And thanks to all the people online who have been watching all these hours. Of course, I can't control it, but uh, of I can't control how many people have been doing this the whole session, because it's different to be here or to, to be uh, online. Uh, thank you for being present as well. And I would say let's close this and let's go upstairs and just have an informal meeting and exchange of thoughts and ideas for the future as well. Thank you very much.